Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this caricaturized Churchill British Infantry Tank. The model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model is built predominantly out of the box, and will be going over all of the kit's unique features, as well as giving the model a thorough in-box review. So stay tuned, because there's going to be a bunch of content coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the British Churchill Infantry Tank. Or at least that's what it's supposed to be. What this vehicle here, this is a caricaturized version of the Churchill British Infantry Tank. And this particular model is from a video game known as World War Tunes. And with this channel, doing this type of content can mean one thing and one thing only. It's officially April 1st, since this channel's tradition is to always do World War Tunes model builds on April Fool's Day. World War Tunes is an online video game that has been around for a number of years now, and what's interesting about it is that while the video game takes place during World War II or a World War II time frame, unlike the other contemporaries, this game focuses on a cartoonish type art style that really makes it unique compared to the other offerings. The game is quite similar to, I guess, Team Fortress 2 and also that old Battlefield Heroes game that probably all five people remember. What's really unique about the video game, outside of the art style, is that this game company hooked up with the Mang Plastic Model Company and they released a range of plastic model kits from the tanks that are in the game. All of the caricaturized game tanks have made its way into the IRL format via a plastic kit. And the Mang World War Tunes range is actually a pretty interesting and very collectible tank range in its own right. And it's one that has been picking up quite a bit of popularity since the release of these kits a number of years ago. Although the vehicles are wonky with the proportions, they still have the look and the feel of the real vehicles that they are parroting. In this case, it's none other than the British Churchill Infantry Tank. But of course, the same can be said about all the other vehicles in the World War II's lineup as well. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this Meng World War Tunes caricaturized Churchill model kit. The Churchill here is one of the more recent additions to the Meng World War Tunes lineup. Just like with the other kits in the World War Tunes range, these ones are fairly easily come by and when found are affordable. This one here I picked up for about 20 bucks on eBay and it's been sitting in the stash for about six months. Starting with the model's box art and graphic design, here we have the vehicle front and center. The quality of the illustration is decently rendered, which is the case for all of the box arts found on the World War II's model kits. The artist does a really good job with balancing out the quality of detailing found on the surfaces, along with the cartoonish nature present on this line of model kits. As for the remainder of the graphic design, it's quite typical for the other models in the Mang World War II range, where we have these two diagonal vertical lines going on either side of the box heart. Why this is done? Well, it gives it some nice aesthetics, but also it's there in case you have more than one kit lined up either in a store setting or possibly just on your display shelf. And once all the boxes connect together, it forms this cool continuous banner effect like you see here. Outside of the vertical lines, here we have the Mang Model Company logo along with the kit number, which for the Churchill it's WWT-017. On the opposite side we have the World War II's video game logo and this little gear motif. And on the bottom portion we have just the model subject matter. And of course it's in that really cool cartoony font that again is a staple on all of these World War II's plastic model kit boxes. From the front takes to the side tabs, which have the same type of appearance found on the other World War II's kits. Namely, we have a larger portion here of the illustration at hand with some more of the verbiage that I mentioned before. It is a mirror image on the opposite side. 
And moving towards the sides, here we have something that's a little bit different compared to some of the other World War II's releases, where generally there's an advert here for MIG paints, and on one of the other vehicles I reviewed, it's actually for Meng's own branded paint. For the Churchill here, the or on this example, I should say, we just have some other kits that are available in the World War II's lineup, such as several other tanks. Aside from the tanks, you can see they also went ahead and spread out to releasing other non tank related kits such as the cartoony Lancaster bomber that we have over here. And although I'm not an airplane guy, I gotta say it is pretty cool that they went ahead and did that. On the reverse side, just like what is typical on the other World War II's kits, we have a little side and front profile of the vehicle in question. Along with several other bits of corporate information, namely the, what would have been the game developer logo and info found in this corner. Originally it would have been from the company Rookvan, but at some point it appears they changed name to Rascali, or I believe those are the ones that own the rights now, but that information is not really up to me to know. On the back portion, we have several other bits of information. We have the World War II's video game logo right there on the top and on the bottom, which is quite typical found on these kits, we have a screenshot of the vehicle in question. On the right hand side we have some more information and of course it wouldn't be a World War II's tank kit if it wasn't Olga approved, which of course this one is. And that's all there is to the outside, but let's go ahead and crack this kit open and see what's on the inside, you know, the most important bits. Just like with all of the World War II's kits, they are side opening, which again is something that's fairly unique found on plastic model kits, tank kits specifically. All of the parts are self-contained in this one bag that we have here, and this is another trait found on all the other World War II's kits that I've built in the past. Another trait that's found on the World War II's kits that's also present on this one is the kit's composition. All of the World War II's kits are made almost exclusively out of standard injection molded plastic. The only parts that are not made of standard hard plastic are the tracks, which are made out of a single piece, flexible vinyl type material. Okay, dumping all the parts on the table, the first thing that sticks out to me is just how large this model actually is. It's a nice chunky kit, which is, I guess representative of the Churchill in question, but also this is true for many of the other World War II's kits. The plastic on them is made out of a very thick, robust, sturdy type of material, which is great so once the model is built, it's not going to be something that's going to be really frail or fragile. Starting with the two hull sections, the lower portion here is this one molding piece, which is nicely designed and it's also nicely constructed. The upper portion is really nicely rendered with the type of details that are integrally molded on. The details, even though the subject matter is cartoony, but the quality of the details found on the molded pieces are very nicely executed. Note here we have all those rigidity ribs found on the top tin work of the Churchill, which is an iconic bit of detailing for this vehicle. And the remainder of the details also follow suit. So from the hulls takes us to the turret section, which is another loose bit of molding. Just like with the hulls, it's a nice, sturdy, chunky bit of plastic. And it's also equally as nice with the quality of details that are molded on. From the turret takes us to the remainder of the runner sections, and this one here does have only two runners supplied with it, but you'll see that this does have a considerable large number of parts compared to some of the other kits in the World War II's range. Here we have the running gear, which as you can see will give you a lot of wheels. In fact, I believe this is the most amount of wheels supplied on a World War II's model. And here we have the side sections, which have some really cool spring details integrally molded on. Along with all the wheels, we have a ton of little stems that are obviously gonna be used as axles to secure the wheels to these appropriate locations. But of course, more information on that is to come. The next runner consists of several of the turret and upper hull components. Here we have the turret bottom pan, along with those two boxy air intakes that are another iconic bit of detailing for this pattern of vehicle. And the remainder of the details are what you would expect for a vehicle of this pattern. We do have some nicely molded tow cables that do have their cable detailings integrally molded on. We have the British fire extinguishers. They're a bit simplistic but again stylized because of the subject matter and the barrel is slide molded so we have a nice hollow muzzle brake 
I may drill this out a little bit deeper, but we'll see how that pans out as the build goes on. The next bit of detailing are the kit's single piece vinyl tracks. Just like with the other kits in the World War II's lineup, they are made out of the same material and do have the same types of detailing found on both the exterior and the interior sections. On the exterior portion, you can see the stylized Churchill pattern track. The detailing is nicely rendered on them considering the subject matter and also the medium. And on the inside, we have those little horizontal bars that go across, which mimic, or I should say, are a stylized version of the inner hinge detailing found on tank tracks in general. These tracks here, I've had some really good results with painting and weathering on the past World War II's tank builds, and on this kit here, I'm expecting the same type of result. For the model's markings, the kit supplies you with a set of water slide decals. Just like with the other models found in the World War II's lineup, these decals here should be of exquisite quality, and I'm not predicting any issues to be had with them. Finally, this takes it to the instruction manual, and just like with all the other World War II's kits, the instructions on this one here are going to be in the same format, where they're going to be nicely rendered out and also nicely executed. Unlike most other kits out there where they just give you a white folded piece of paper with some CAD drawings in them, and sometimes even just hand drafted drawings depending on the age of the kit, for these World War II's models, you can see that a lot of attention has been paid to the graphic design on the inside and the presentation looks really good. The way the CAD drawings are laid out are really clear and concise, which of course aids with the overall simplicity that these kits do have. On the rear portion here, we have a really cool color palette where we have a sample of a built model along with the suggestion points for the addition of the markings. This one appears to be one of the more complex World War II's kits like I mentioned before in terms of both the number of parts, the paintwork that needs to be done on it, but also with some of the construction. I could tell you right off the bat, this one's gonna be a little bit tricky specifically for me because of the way the tracks are designed. You see the Churchill, once it's fully built, you're not gonna be able to squeeze the track into this section over here. This was very similar to what I encountered on the M26 Pershing and also on the King Tiger, but on the Churchill here, it's gonna be a little bit more tricky in trying to fit the tracks in place. Generally on my builds, the tracks are the very last thing that gets mounted to the model before it's completed, but on this one, I'm gonna to have to see if I'm gonna to have to go through the build in a slightly different manner. It's gonna be a bit interesting. We'll see how this pans out. Also, while I have these pieces here laid out on the table, I might as well take the opportunity to compare and contrast this kit with another Churchill kit of similar size. What kit might that be? Well, here I have this old school Aurora Churchill kit. This kit, of course, dates back to the 70s, and let's compare that briefly to the World War II's one from the 2020s. The vehicles are similar in size in terms of width, only this one's just a slight bit wider and it's also much more stout, but you get to see the quality difference compared to a kit molded in the 1970s, or I should say the 1960s probably, these kits are fairly old, compared to the modern tooling found on the World War II's model. One other thing that kind of stood out to me was with the dimensions of the turret. Here we got the old school Aurora one, and compared to the World War II's one, they're almost the same size. In fact, I think they might even be interchangeable. Might be for a weird project if Atlantis ever does a re-release of one of these. Starting with the model suspension, this is probably one of the biggest aspects of this entire build, and it's the part that has the most of the complexity. The pieces themselves are decently rendered and are also decently designed where the pieces are nice and robust and are also very easy to install. On the wheels, they're held in place by a single peg that goes into a corresponding hole found on the hull itself. The tolerances on the peg are quite typical what you'd expect to see on these kits and they make for a nice snug install. However, if you are going through the installation, it would help to run an X-Acto knife over the areas that are on the peg that would make contact with the inner wall area of the corresponding hole. This is done to make sure that the pieces slide in easier and when doing so it's going to require less force of the builder to push the pieces in place. If you're encountering some resistance 
if you continue to add the pressure to it, what's going to happen is the piece will probably bend and snap on you before the piece gets fully seated. And if that happens to you, that situation is something that's really less than ideal. By going over the areas with an X-Acto, this will loosen up the tolerances and will make for the installation to go by much easier. One other thing that's also crucial to point out on my builds, as again, the suspension is added after everything is fully painted and weathered. And on these locations here, you're gonna have some areas of paint buildup. And if that happens, that's just gonna make the, the snugness of the parts that much more, which means it is really important to go ahead and remove those layers of paint and maybe a little bit of plastic with the scraping of the X-Acto. Once that's completed, of course, the wheels just go on without any problems. The next thing to point out is how the model gets assembled. This one here, I have to do something a little bit different compared to my other builds where, as I've stated in many of my videos, the model is fully built, painted and weathered, and then the tracks are the last thing to get installed. Well, this one here was no different. However, the method of assembly had to have been slightly altered. Because of the design here of the side armor plate, you're not gonna be able to get the single piece of vinyl tracks in their corresponding locations. So one thing that I did on this particular build was that I actually built, painted and weathered it with the upper hull not connected to the lower. With the way the model is designed, how it goes together, it's very similar to the Tamiya, which was done that way for motorization purposes, but it makes the assembly and installation of the tracks very convenient. Because you paint and weather everything separately, the tracks then get mounted in place, and then one of the last things to do is to secure the upper and lower hull halves together. With the way the kit is designed, the tolerances are so good that no glue is really required in order to do it. It's just, you can friction fit it in place and will stay there forevermore. In fact, on this model here, that's exactly how I did it. I didn't add a drop of glue to those pegs. I just lined everything up, just, added the appropriate amount of pressure in the correct locations, and the piece just seated absolutely perfectly. With the way the kit is designed, where the upper and lower hull sections meet, the seams are completely non-existent, and in, it's just indicative of a very well-designed kit. On the back portion over here, I, I'm not even sure you can even see it, but there's probably a small little seam running uh, along this section. Basically, the area below this box is the top portion, and Anything below is the lower hull. And unless I pointed that out, no one was gonna notice. Even the same thing is true for the front section that we have right here. While on the side of the hull, you can see the remainder of the details, which include the ventilation boxes, as well as the tow cable. All these pieces are nicely designed and just snap into place without any problems. One thing that I did do on the tow cable and also was true for the spare track rack over there was a common feature found in these World War II tanks is the holes are very tight with the corresponding pegs, and this can potentially lead to issues where the piece will bend and snap before it just gets inserted in place. One tip that I'd like to recommend on anyone who's building one of these World War II tanks is to slightly enlarge the holes on these locations with the use of a pin vise and a small Dremel bit. If you just remove just a little bit amount of material, this will loosen up the tolerances and the pieces will be able to be installed with much less of an effort. While on the bow portion, nothing really much to mention except for on the bow MG, I went ahead and drilled it out with a Dremel and a small pin vise, and this is a reoccurring thing that I do on many of my builds, and these ones here are no exception, and are done exactly for the same reasons. The same thing was also done to the coax, which is found right here next to the main barrel. While on the rear portion of the vehicle, you can see the rear tow point, and what's cool is that on this model here they are fully functional and they just snap into place without any glue being necessary. On the jerry can, this is the kit supply piece, went out without any problems, it's a nicely detailed piece overall. To, in order to really enhance it further, I just painted it a different color compared to the rest of the vehicle, and I also went with my usual weathering technique. Around the little nozzle end, I added a little swipe of gloss black and some gloss lacquer to it just to give it a little sheen to replicate that sooty, sweaty type appearance that's very common on oil and gas cans in general. Moving up takes us to the turret and there's not really a whole lot going on here. The kit's turret is very nicely engineered and it goes together very quickly and again pretty much effortlessly. 
On the rear portion here, we have those two British pattern fire extinguishers. And for the paintwork, in order to make them pop, I went ahead and painted them in the configuration that you see here. It's not uncommon for these British pattern of fire extinguishers to be painted in this format, where the canister itself is painted in red, and the nozzle section would be brass. There are a few different options out there for painting these canisters from red to a darker green, and I believe there's a blue in there if I'm not mistaken. But regardless, you do have several options of Available to the builder and basically you just you know pick one that you deem fit. Moving forward takes it to the main barrel section as well as the trunnion and the piece is again nicely engineered. The component doesn't droop and has a nice stiffness to it which is great so you could prop the barrel where you want it and it's not going to you know fall down on you and need a little drop of glue in order to hold it up. On the barrel itself just like what I touched upon before with the MGs I went ahead and drilled out these sections here with a Dremel, well the bigger one here I use the Dremel, the smaller ones of course I use the pin vise, and just like with all the other World War II's tanks I'm going to be posting, you really can't see in there due to the lighting situation that I have, but the thing is drilled out further to give it a little bit extra detailing. Moving upward takes to the commander's cupola and the commander's hatch. Both of these components are very easily installed and get mounted on without any problems. One thing that I do want to touch upon with the hatches is that this kit does have functional hatches. However, the design of the hinges are a bit chintzy and because of that, I really don't recommend opening and closing them up very frequently because you can run the risk of possibly damaging something. The hinge design is also the type where it kind of just dangles there and it's not really held on in a positive manner. So if you're gonna open up the hatch, it's going to be very likely that the piece is just going to fall off of the hinge and then it has the potential of getting lost. Of course, this is something that's no way a deal breaker, but this is something to keep in mind specifically if someone is to looking to have some playability in mind, you really don't want to mess around with the hatches too much. But again, they are functional in case someone, you know, feels so inclined to play with them. And that's it for the details, so that brings us to the paint and the markings. For the model's paint work, I wanted to go with that North African pattern that was basically seen on the model's box art. For the paintwork on this one here, this is all done via the airbrush, and the colors I used was Tamiya Buff and Tamiya Olive Green. Then I went ahead and added a multitude of my usual washes and filters in order to bring it up to the weathered state that you have here, plus some dry brushing to seal it off. For the markings, the kit supply decals were utilized and the water slide decals that are supplied with the model are, not surprisingly, very excellent. They go on without any problems and then they are sealed absolutely perfectly with the VMS matte varnish. There are quite a bit of markings on this particular model. In fact, I think this one probably had the most amount of markings on any of the other World War II's kits that I've done. But regardless, the instructions are pretty well laid out. And if you take your time and follow the instructions, you should easily be able to add the markings to their appropriate locations. At the end of the day, I am in love with this model. I love every facet of it, from the subject matter, to the execution, to the final outcome with the painting and the weathering, everything could not have been any better with this one. I really, really did enjoy this build. I mean, this isn't really uncommon for the World War II's models as they are always something that's enjoyable to build and they never disappoint, but this one here was just one that I just really had more enjoyment with the assembly compared to some of the other ones that I've done in the past. Which I feel is a perfect point to pivot us into skill level and recommendation. Just like with the other World War II's tanks, the Churchill here is something that can be built by just about anybody. From the beginner to the advanced, as well as everyone else in between. This model is very well engineered and goes together very easily. For recommendations, well, if you've seen the other World War II's reviews on this channel, this one here is absolutely no different. If you're an avid fan, of the World War II's video game, this is going to be something that you shouldn't even be questioning at this point. Outside of that type of a person, if you're the type of person who just loves World War II armor, World War II British armor, the Churchill itself, or just the vehicles that participate in the North African campaign, this kit here ticks all of those boxes. It is an excellent addition to add to any of those collections. Another person who I can see really digging this kit would be anyone who's a fan of the Girls in Panzers anime. 
For some reason, my spidey senses are telling me that there's probably a set of markings out there for the St. Gloria Academy where you can add it to this model to make it a cartoonish rendition of the one from the anime. And I'm pretty sure they have the vinyl or 3D printed figures from that anime, which will just go perfectly with this one here. I can already see the girl sipping her tea up in the Commander's Cupola, but I'll leave that to some weeb who's really into that stuff. Outside of that type of a person, if you're the type of person that is just looking for a nice, simple, quick build, or you're a youth builder and are looking for, you know, a model that's easy to build and has some, you know, playability to it, this kit here, like with many of the other World War II's models, is highly recommended. On a similar note, if you're a parent or a grandparent and are looking for a nice, enjoyable project to spend with your kid or grandkid for a weekend or an afternoon, all the World War II's tanks are recommended for that, but this one here is definitely something that would be greatly appreciated. This one goes together very, very easily, even more so than compared to some of the other World War II's tanks, and because of that, would be a phenomenal project to share with a person that you want to spend some time with. On top of that, another thing that's interesting about this kit is its general size. As you can see, it is a substantial size model for what it is. It's much bigger than many of the other kits in the World War II's lineup. And because of that, someone who's looking for something with a little bit more playability is going to appreciate the size and heft of this model here compared to some of the other ones. Like if we compare this to the Stuart or the 38T, the Churchill here is much more substantial in size. And because of that, it would be more appreciated by someone who's looking to enjoy it in that manner. Something else that these World War II's models have going for them is that they make excellent gifts. If you know someone who is an avid model builder, or if they're just into you know arts and crafts and they have a bunch of models in their collection, this would be the type of thing to give to them as a gift. They might not necessarily have this kit in their collection, or it might not be something that they would actively think about, but if it was given to them as a gift, they would definitely appreciate it. Something else to consider about these World War II's models is if the person is unsure on how to paint a more expensive model kit. If you're, well, you know, we're talking about Churchill's over here. Let's just say you have either the Tamiya or the AFV Club options of the Churchill out there, and you're not really sure on how to go about with the painting, with the patterns, the weathering techniques, or even the paint application techniques. You might want to experiment on one of these World War II's models here as a good dry run before you commit to something expensive like the AFE Club or the Tamiya. If you use one of these kits as a dry run, this will sharpen your skills and you'll know exactly how to go about certain aspects of the paintwork, which when it comes time to do it on the larger kits, you're not going to have any surprises and you're going to be more confident with the application. In the end, this will actually make the other expensive kits turn out a bit nicer compared to just going in rough if you're you know, second guessing yourself on several of the options to go with for paint as well as weathering. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video on this caricaturized British Churchill infantry tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been showcased on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, and I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Until then.